Hello, I'm Michael from Hall Spirit and Activism and uh, what a great haircut you have. I was reading through the letter of James today and it just struck me how this apostle, this brother of Jesus who is leading the church in Jerusalem really is impacted by their community of goods and that is so evident in his letter. He emphasizes that Christians shouldn't be rich. He has some really harsh criticism of the rich in um, chapter 5 and in chapter 2 he emphasizes that the kingdom reality that Christians live in, the brother and sisterhood that we are attached to as followers of Jesus should impact our meetings. He says that when a rich man eventually pops up because he hasn't joined the community yet um, we shouldn't treat him as a privileged person while uh, forcing a poor person to um, you know, sit on the floor or something like that. And James is writing his letter to all Christians, so this doesn't really talk about um, the, the Jerusalem situation, but it's really something that he has heard about and that he's very critical to. And I think that, of course, he is impacted by the teachings of Jesus that really emphasize this, but also he is definitely impacted by the way they do church in Jerusalem. God has spoken to me a lot about this recently, how we should embody our faith in the church life and really the way to prevent heresy effectively and, and to strengthen each other in our discipleship is to form our church life according to uh, the apostolic model in the New Testament. So a church that has community of goods will have much less risk of falling into the heresies of mammonism and prosperity theology than a church which doesn't. And this is very evident today in the monastic traditions, in the Hutterite communities, the Jesus Army, Jesus People Church. Um, prosperity theology and mammonism is very rare. Rather, um, people emphasize simplicity and equality uh, throughout generations because that is what they are living in. Likewise, a church that evangelizes publicly as organized events, as church services weekly, will have much less risk of the heresies of thinking that evangelism should not be performed publicly or that we should not have to evangelize. And this again is very evident uh, today. The church that I'm a part of evangelizes continuously and people who don't think that we should evangelize, they don't join our church. But we who are a part of it, we get formed by our church life. We get trained and equipped in public evangelism and get really good at it and, and lead people to Christ. Um, even in our daily lives as well, you know, this equips us for evangelism all the time. Um, and the same is true for, you know, um, church building versus house churches in the house church movement. Simplicity is uh, much more prevalent and um, people don't fall into mammonism as much there as well. Of course, community of goods is ideal um, to get totally vaccinated against those sorts of heresies. And it's also evident that churches that emphasizes uh, weird stuff <laughs> um, and unbiblical stuff, they really hold on to that. For example, here in Sweden we have the Lutheran Church. It used to be the former state church. It's called the Church of Sweden still. And it's extremely liberal. Um, many priests don't even believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the resurrection, don't believe in the virgin birth and um, things like that. I've heard uh, testimonies of priests confessing that they're actually atheists. They do it for the money. Um, some that say that it doesn't matter what you believe in, you know, and, and please join our church instead. So there, there's a lot of heresy there. And this is, of course, due to their history and that they still want the majority of the Swedish population to be members in the church. Currently about 70% of the population are, even though 15% of their believers, of their, of their, of their members say that they believe in Jesus. Um, so of course, the majority of the church members are not Christian, but they want to keep that and so they change the message. Now, interestingly, there are some areas that they definitely won't change or it is very hard for them to change. And, and some of them are, are very unbiblical, like the idea that only priests um, should um, 
what's the word organized communion i guess you know read read the sacred words from first corinthians 11 which wasn't used in in the early church necessarily like in didache they don't use that that sort of formula um but there, there come in that this this has to be done for communion to be served um, also, infant baptism, which is not referenced at all in the New Testament. The first reference we have is Tertullian in the early 3rd century, late 2nd century, and he condemns it. He says it's not a good idea. Uh, but that's really something that they hold on to. Why? Well, it's a sacramental church. So, communion and baptism, as well as um, these other events like um, uh, marriages, which there is no evidence at all or no command at all in the Bible that Christian churches uh, should arrange marriages. There's, there's nothing in the New Testament suggesting that, but that's really a cornerstone because it's engraved in their activity. That is their church life. That is what they hold on to. Even when they completely change their theology and, and they question the Bible and everything and Christianity and, and some of them, you know, question Jesus himself, um, they still hold on to these traditions because that's what they do. And I think, you know, that what, what we do as Christians really hits us in, in the heart. And, and our theology is very often formed because of that. You know, most, peop most Christians I encounter that um, believe that Christians should not evangelize publicly. Don't evangelize publicly, right? And, and of course, it can go the other way. You can come up with an idea and say, hey, we should stop doing this. But I think that that's always harder to do when you know, you're used to doing something good. Um, compared to if, if it's the other way around. So my point is really that the structure of the church, how the church is formed and whether it is like the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts, uh, the apostolic church where all other churches come from and that was extremely normative in the early church. Um, if it looks like that and if you um, nurture and treasure that structure, um, you will get a much more biblical theology. You will get more biblical disciples. It will be much easier to disciple them compared to if you have this other model. And many say today that, yeah, the Jerusalem model is passé. You know, it may be work for them. It doesn't work for us today. In my experience, all those who say that have churches that are objectively worse than the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church led people to Christ every single day day nobody was poor because of community of goods and they experienced a lot of signs and wonders is that really your church i mean i guess that is quite evident that the church that jesus started that the apostles continued in jerusalem really what we should achieve and we should treasure the model the structure um and and embody it because that is a key also to our theoretical understanding of what the gospel is about and how discipleship should be lived out. Thank you for watching and God bless you.